Before I start, I have to say um, that it's imperative to always put out one caveat when dealing with consciousness altering substances. These are very potent substances. Um, they need to be treated with great respect. They are not for everyone. They are contraindicated for certain people. Um, and they are uh, best done in a safe and supportive environment with experienced people on hand. Um, and they are still illegal nationally and internationally, despite wonderful decriminalization efforts in a number of localities. So I, I feel compelled to, to point all these things out before we start. Um, so um, to jump into the topic, um, as Paul mentioned in the talk, many of you I'm sure saw earlier, we are really um, in a moment of a sea change as, uh, as to how mainstream society is viewing drugs in general and um, psychedelics specifically. And there are many aspects to this transformative moment, but I want to quickly mention three of them. Um, the first is that it's become painfully obvious to nearly everyone what a catastrophe the war on drugs has been, what an enormous waste of resources and of human lives. Um, it's been incredibly structurally racist, really hitting black and brown communities particularly hard. Um, and as symbolized by the congressional vote we saw yesterday, the historic vote in Congress, to decriminalize cannabis, this is obviously beginning to change. We still have a long way to go, but mercifully these attitudes are changing vis-a-vis -vis drugs in general and getting away from punitive attitudes. <clears throat> the second um, factor, which is a very different but a fascinating socio-cultural development, is that we are seeing this enormous growth of new forms of sacred plant subcultures and undergrounds around the world. Um, especially the ayahuasca subculture, which is just um, taken off to incredible lengths globally. Um, and some people feel that that's a really positive thing, that it's giving people access to healing methodologies and to self-exploration they didn't have before. Um, there are issues though in these subcultures that are raised by them. One is the thorny question of appropriation of indigenous traditions by non-Indigenous people, something we'll get into a little bit later on. I suspect um, there's the issue of over-harvesting of some sacred plants, potentially also another thorny issue, and the fact that because this movement has grown so much, many of the ceremony leaders are inexperienced, um, and unfortunately there have also been instances of abuse and sexual abuse in these milieus, and that's a big discussion, but it's not the one we're going to focus on today, but I did want to at least mention this this aspect of the subcultures. Um, the, the, the third thing is the one that I think we're going to focus most on today, which Paul began to address in his talk earlier, which is after a hiatus of many decades, um, there's been a, res a resuscitation of scientific research on psychedelics um, that has, as Paul showed, there were 40 different institutions, you know, from Johns Hopkins and NYU to universities in the UK, you know, all over the place that are getting really tantalizing results about the cure, the potential curative properties of some psychedelics to address really difficult um, ailments such as PTSD and depression and end of life anxiety. Um, and that's really exciting. Um, and that's a lot of what we'll talk about today because um, so many people suffer from these very hard to treat um, conditions. That said, and I think this will be another um, gist of our conversation, is the fact that, you know, with any big new development, there are problems raised. And I hate to be dialectically Marxist about this, but uh, that's, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, one of the, the, the issues <laughs> really, um, is the issue of desacralization, where um, because psychedelic uh, were developed, discovered, nurtured by indigenous traditions, for hundreds of years, sometimes thousands of years, in a context of reverence for the natural world, in a, in a cohesive cultural context, to go from a, a reverent model to a sort of sanitized, medicalized model. If a medicalized model of psychedelic use becomes the only socially acceptable one, that will be deeply tragic for some of us with a long-standing interest in these things. And then more problematic, again, as Paul began to mention this, is the fact that venture capitalists are now pouring into this, to this new field, hoping to cash in on what they view as a potential growth industry within the pharmaceutical industry. And 
you know, there's a big problem of going from reverence to hyper-capitalist commodification. Um, so that's something that we have to be aware of. So look, the, the genie's out of the bottle, the cat's out of the bag, pick your metaphor. We're not going to be able to turn back the clock. And this could be a very good thing because a lot of people could be helped. Um, but it does raise these thorny issues. And there is no better group of people I can think of on planet Earth to tackle some of these questions than the three folks we have with us today, because they're very different, coming from very different places. But I would say that I don't know three more experienced, uh, more knowledgeable, and more ethical people in this entire domain than, than the three folks we have with us today. So I'm going to rapidly introduce them. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail because you can look up their bios online. These are very accomplished people. So there's a lot to read about all of them. I and mean, we want to spend the time in conversation, not in me reading bios. But let me just say very quickly, um, well, most of you know Paul Stamets and heard him earlier, but let me just say Paul is one of the great mycologists on planet Earth. He's a great mycoentrepreneur, mycotechnologist, and his interest in fungi goes far beyond psychedelic mushrooms. He has created uh, medicinal compounds. He's discovered species of fungi hitherto unknown to man and woman. Uh, and he has um, uh, cr created amazing technologies to remediate toxins in the environment using fungi. But since we're here discussing psychedelics, Paul is also probably the most knowledgeable person on the planet as regards psilocybin. So, and this was also his idea. This panel was convened by Paul so we, we have Paul to thank for being here and for, for picking these inter interlocutors. So um, the other person we have with us today, another person is Gudgy Cook. Gudgy is a dear old friend and ally of Bioneers going back decades. She's a Mohawk from Aquasasne, the Mohawk lands in what we white people call Northern New York State and Southern Ontario and Southern Quebec along the St. Lawrence River. And Gudgy is a legendary figure in the, in the revitalization of indigenous midwifery traditions. She's also been a great fighter for indigenous women's health for decades and decades and a researcher in that area. She's also really helped revitalize a lot of indigenous cultures through giving a voice to elders in those communities. And her work is broad and all encompassing. I can't do it justice here, but we, the reason we really wanted Gudji here in this discussion is that she also has long standing experience with the use of peyote, um, which we'll see is somewhat of a cultural exception in the matters we're going to discuss here today. But um, so welcome Gudji. And last but definitely not least is Françoise Orza. And Françoise is someone who also has decades of experience in research and study um, and teaching about sacred plants. She's done decades of field work with the Mazatec in Mexico, um, and she's a somatic therapist in the Bay Area in California. And she's written a very interesting book I recommend highly called Conscious with Medicine. So this is a great crew. We're gonna begin with Paul because, hey, this was his his uh, his idea to get us here together. And then we'll follow with Gudgie and then Francoise, and then ideally we'll engage in some lively conversation. So Paul, take it away and uh, here you go. Well, thank you. Thank you uh, very much, JP. You're so eloquent. Um, yeah, I, I'm just going to do a short intro. I'm going to show two very short films, one four minute, one one minute. Uh, right now, this is a worldwide revolution uh, for a paradigm shift in consciousness. A lot of us in the environmental and indigenous rights and civil rights movement, it's been a long struggle for a lot of us. The commonality that we all share is the importance of the ecosystem and the importance of the mother that's given us birth. And we have to protect our ecosystems and we have to think downstream on the effect of future generations. The, the narrative that has hit me hardest or best has been the concept of seven generations. As a scientist now, we can see that this concept is deeply intelligent the, the wisdom of indigenous people espousing the concept of seven generations resonate now with us it's so well in terms of understanding climate change, the loss of biodiversity, the sixth greatest extinction event that we're experiencing currently, zoonotic diseases coming from the deforestation and the factory farms. Um, so it really is a call from the planet right now to, uh, to have more voices uh, join in the chorus uh, that can create solutions uh, that influence us all. We are no longer separated by borders, a virus in China, 
a virus in Africa, a virus in Wisconsin uh, can be spread all over the world. And so it really underscores the importance of our commonality of our being. So I want to just first show these two shorts um, and then I'm gonna speak just for about three to five minutes and then and pass the torch. So um, David, if you would please uh, queue up the four minute video, we can watch that now. That was very, it's very difficult to get, to wrap your head around. I'm, I'm dying. The chances are that I'm not going to be around in a couple of years. I heard about a network in Vancouver of therapists who are uh, treating patients with psilocybin, patients with anxiety, and deal who are dealing with life and death issues. I thought that really sounds interesting to me and and there's no danger i'm there with two other people in the room and uh, so it's something i want it's worth trying because i i need to be able to enjoy my life and all of a sudden everything was light and and beautiful and, and warm and and uh, i felt just this rush of warmth and love and and just peace come over me as, as the lights came up. I'm so fortunate that I had those connections that I heard about this uh, network of therapists that are willing to risk their licenses to treat people with this drug that's not not legal. And I think it's so wrong that people don't have access to this because people are in pain and dying and uh, or PTSD or depression and which studies show psilocybin helps all of those things and why are we not allowing people to have this drug but we allow them to have other drugs that are so harmful we have given people the right to die um, and and I think that's great. It's I don't know if I'll be brave enough to choose that option if the time comes. Um, but it's there for people when they if they need it. But what about living? What do we do in between that part in the process of dying? It's a long process sometimes. So how are we going to pe help people through it? Do we want? people to be living with the anxiety and fear or do we want to provide them a way to be able to deal deal with things that need to be dealt with in their life that are painful and hard um, but also to be able to experience the love and joy and peace that that this has provided to me and to other people that I've talked to this trip actually changed everything for me because now I'm able to live each day just with peace and joy and love every day and and not have this thing weighing on me. I feel so much healthier and lighter in a, in a way even though I have this thing inside me that could kill me but like I said Today, I'm not gonna die, I'm good. <laughs> and that's all, that's all any of us have. There's two things certain in life. We are born and we die. Where did we come from? Where are we going? With the psilocybin mushroom experience, you suddenly know that you're part of a giant oneness. And it gives you context and consolation about your own mortality. So I think it's critically important that at the end of your life, you have a right to these substances. Who dares say that you do not? When these have been used for thousands, probably tens of thousands, maybe millions of years, and laws have been created to ostracize people to use them only in the past 50 years? I mean, it's, it's 
it, it, it's not only academically naive, it's immoral. And it's, I, I think that everyone has a right to how they're going to leave this life. Well, I want to give a big uh, thank you to uh, Peg from Falling Frog uh, Productions and for Theracil. Theracil is a therapeutic psilocybin movement um, in Canada that's been petitioning the federal government to give exemptions uh, so people at the end of their life have a right to these substances. There's also in the United States the right to try movement, very similar, to be able to use off-label drugs you know, at the end of your life for hopefully making uh, your disease cycle um, have a better outcome. And I would argue the better outcome would be just reconciling with, with your own mortality. So this movement is spreading all over the world. And there is a pharmaceuticalization of, of psychedelics, especially psilocybin. Um, and this is something that we must come to grips with. Now, no matter what happens uh, with the pharmaceutical interest in producing synthetic uh, psilocybin, 99% um, of the people are going to use mushrooms. <laughs> this is it's just the way it is. Uh, the, it, the psilocybin mushrooms can be easily grown at home in your backyard. Um, it's it's, it's there's, they're grown all over the world. There's been a decades of, of, of people honing their skills in this. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of people get them from their friends, their trusted friends. And Frankly, going into a physician's office and meeting an austere looking professional um, that, that's a stranger to you is a pretty steep hurdle to overcome for a lot of people emotionally. That being said, the therapeutic use of psilocybin uh, necessitates um, having therapists, um, being very careful, uh, making sure um, that these substances are used, used in a responsible way. Um, I, I, people who know me know I hate, and I hate very few things, but I hate the word shrooms. You know, to me, it's just, it just uh, undercuts and just marginalizes these sacred uh, mushrooms as being party drugs. And I understand the coming of age and people wanting to experiment and change their consciousness. You know, Andrew Weil's book, The Natural Mind was a huge influence on me. Um, so it's natural for what you want to change your consciousness. But that being said, you know, let's all be adults about this. Uh, these are very important substances. Now, we have been doing a lot of research. I had a DEA license for many years. I've discovered and named four new psilocybin active species. As I mentioned before in my talk, there's about 216 species in the genus Psilocybe. That's the taxonomic group, the genus. And about 116 species are psilocybin active. About 25 species grow here in North America, anywhere from Texas to, to Northern British Columbia, you know, different species in those different ecosystems. But the psilocybin mushrooms have within them other compounds. And it's been, in particular, these are other tryptamines, um, psilocybin dephosphorylase into psilocin, and there's baocystin, norbaocystin, and norcilocin. Uh, we have been doing research on neurogenesis with Harvard Medical School. Uh, we've also been doing it with a company in, uh, that's specialized in uh, anti-Alzheimer uh, uh, drugs. Um, and we also are growing pluripotent stem cells you know, in our own laboratories now, um, using these well-established protocols for measuring neurons and how they grow. And we have found the entourage effect to be huge. Not, and so these psilocybin analogs I mentioned, they're legal, they're not, they, but they don't get you high. And so the fact that the entourage effect is showing neurogenesis way beyond any one of these by themselves. And so when they're stacked together and you have them in a natural form in dried mushrooms, you are getting an entourage benefit in neurogenesis that I think progressively will lead to increased intelligence, uh, increased creativity. When you're creative, you're happier. When you're happier, you're more creative. I mean, literally, it's a kind of a, this is a binary fork. Um, and we know now that people from psilocybin mushrooms, not only they were able to overcome their PTSD and, and depression, et cetera, but it changes their life. And in fact, I told Michael Pollan, you know, psilocybin mushrooms changed my mind. Um, and I think they, they organically did. 
uh, they build a new neurons for me that allowed me to articulate and become a more creative and peaceful uh, person. Um, and so I think these psilocybin mushrooms are Einstein mushrooms. And with the great tragedy of the commons is our elders with all this knowledge and experience, how to act, how not to act, equally as important, to lose this body intellect of knowledge at the end of their life, not being able to pass these skills down to the next generation is a huge drop off, you know, in our, in our cultural wisdom. And so I think these can create a paradigm shift in increasing the intelligence of our population, reducing crime, reducing disease, and for us to face the inevitability of our, of our, our own death. Um, I recently journeyed on, on psilocybin mushrooms with a physician. Um, I couldn't get off the floor. <laughs> it was, uh, but it, I entered into what I describe as one giant consciousness. The unanimity of being is what we all share. We are very provincial mentally with a limited amount of brain matter that we have in inter interpreting the enormity of the universe, the enormity of reality. These mushrooms and these substances give you a glimpse. It's a door into a greater dimension. And in these experiences, I always hear the voices of all species, of all beings calling out, saying, these are the times we need you most. We need leaders. And as I think that psilocybin mushrooms increase courage, increase kindness, and creates and creates empathy. And these are leadership skills. So I think that we're at a time critical to have new leaders. And I think most of us would agree, we'd rather follow a leader that's kind and courageous and is looking after the interests of the commons and the people more so than just their own interests. And so it is time for a paradigm shift. I think these sacred medicines can, can help us and all of us, you know, are on this planet together. We are all indigenous to this planet. First peoples in many regions of the world are literally first peoples. They migrated. And as they migrated, they brought their ancestral knowledge with them. Now we have this plurality and diversity of ethnicities. And it's so important that we protect these threads of ancient knowledge. So much knowledge has been threads that have been cut from disease, war, religion, and we lose these elders, we lose encyclopedias of knowledge. The fact that we even have any indigenous uh, knowledge that's resident today is, is a triumph of survival. Indigenous peoples have faced, you know, weaponizable pandemics, literally. I speak on this and have spoken on it for decades. Uh, whether intentionally or not, the Europeans brought diseases that were weapons against indigenous peoples. You just can't argue against that. But the fact that we do have this ancestral knowledge that exists today, and the fact that we have the shared unity of being, you know, we all need to respect these sacred medicines and make sure that they're protected, they're used responsibly, they're also driven by fact-based medicine uh, that's showing positive outcomes so we can overcome the hurdles of standardization uh, that are necessary for a pharmacy for products to be able to be prescribed by physicians, et cetera. So there's a lot of ways of looking at this, but psilocybin mushrooms offer within them more components than just one molecule. Pharmaceuticals have been very, very uh, effective at, at treating diseases, but the complexity of what we're facing now Complex problems require complex solutions. Yankoa, Paul, brother, uh, for the power of your voice, your intellect, and uh, your sensitivity. And thank you for inviting my comment in support of the fundamental principle that the endangered sacred medicine peyote should be reserved for indigenous use in this time of climate change and decreasing biological diversity. In one telling of our Mohawk creation story, 
when the pregnant sky woman pulled on a beautiful yellow flower that grew at the base of the withering celestial tree that stood at the base of the sky world. Her action uprooted the tree. As our creation story goes, the pregnant sky woman fell into the hole left by the uprooted tree to fulfill her destiny to recreate the world. In 1974, on a journey to learn indigenous midwifery, I followed my mother-in-law, Beatrice, holy dance long visitor, who later became one of the leading 13 grandmothers, and my well-known sister-in-law, Loretta Afraid of Bear Cook, her daughter, both beloved Oglala Lakota water women. My experiences with and learning from Pejuta Wakan in the Lakota language, the sacred medicine, or Onunkwa Goa in Mohawk, the big medicine, and others who worked to establish the American Indian Freedom of Religion Act of 1978. This act protects the freedom of Native Americans to exercise traditional religions and sacred ceremonial practices, ensuring access to sacred sites in the Peyote Gardens, possession and use of sacred objects in our accustomed manner. We ritualize our life cycle and maintain cycles of sacred ceremonies necessary to support and maintain life in relationship with Pejutawakan, Onungwakboa, riding upon the wave of historic indigenous activist movements like the Indian Unity Caravan of the 1960s, the White Roots of Peace Communications Group out of the Six Nations Confederacy, the International Indian Treaty Councils of the Ocheti Shagoi and the Six Nations Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The grandfather medicine continues to connect indigenous community and family spirit across the hemisphere. There are many protocols and responsibilities for carrying a prayer that first is bundled in a sacred tobacco tie and a kernel of white corn. It's up to the sponsor of the healing ceremony held in specific family fireplaces, like the half moon fireplace of my Lakota relatives to determine who will sit among the circle in support of a prayer for a life. From the gathering of the firewood, its splitting and arrangement upon the fireplace, the attention and protocols of the cedar used in respect of the prayers being offered, to the preparation of the sacred foods presented to the sacred fire and the people in the morning by the water woman who waters the people with spiritual support the proper words, songs, instruments, procedures, the love of the people. There are so many essential elements that belong to the ceremonial commitment of the sacrament, peyote. It takes generations of knowledge and commitment. These things and ways that come from our past are our responsibility to carry as indigenous people because they have value to our resilience and healing, especially at this time of remembering and the renewal of our lives through truth, respect, and humbleness. The prayer ceremony is very much like the process of birth itself, as grandmother medicine opens our minds, bodies, and spirits in coping with the pains of life. Beatrice Holy Dance Long Visitor explained to me how the medicine first came to the people. A pregnant woman was alone and lost in the desert, separated from her people. Tired, she lay on the earth and suffered in labor by herself until she heard a voice nearby. Take and eat of me, a small cactus with no thorns spoke to her. The medicine helped the woman birth her child. The sacred medicine continues to teach and guide us from the fireplaces who take care of these ways. In perceiving how sometimes others approach native culture, our elders can help us to understand. A teaching shared by Ernie Mohawk, Cataraugus Seneca Longhouse Elder, 
describes the sacred tree of indigenous cultures that for a time was withering under the weight of colonization. The roots are the ancestral teachings and ways of our communities and extended families. The trunk of the tree is the history of indigenous people, including the time of civilization regulations of the late 1800s into today, when sacred ceremonies continue under the immense pressures of colonization, the militarization of evangelical Christianity, and the ideology of progress. The branches of the tree are the numerous social, legal, and economic issues and the struggle for the continuity of our lands, jurisdiction, spirituality, languages, and the reproduction of bodies and life ways. At the top of the tree sits one little yellow flower that represents the light and the life of the tree. Sometimes people grasp at that yellow flower first. See the whole tree, the elder tells our allies, our friends. Get to know us, help us, love the people. Then the yellow flower begins to shine. Doneto. Thank you. So thanks so much, Gurji. And we'll get back to some of the themes you raise uh, a bit later on, um, because I think it's important to drive home just how endangered um, peyote is as a plant and why it's imperative um, that it be preserved for the use of indigenous peoples and maybe what some alternatives are for non-indigenous folks. I think a lot of people will be curious about that. But Francoise, why don't we turn it over to you now? So thank you for inviting me, Paul and the Bioneers and uh, Nina and the whole team there. It's wonderful being here finally. I want to talk a little bit about uh, my understanding and my practice of um, the sacred mushroom as it uh, in the context of traditional use of the Mazatec. Uh, in which I've been involved for many years, over over 30 now. The practice of traditional use of mushroom is an entire cosmology, animistic belief, practices that go way beyond the use of plant medicine themselves, which is very interesting for me. And when I go to Huautla de Jimenez, where the tradition continues and we immerse ourselves in that Mazatec land, what we are really... Uh, communing with is not so much the mushroom or not only the mushroom, but with the entire life of the village and life of the mountain and the landscape and the ecology and the rain and the ritual of offering the cocoa beans and the ritual of cleansing with copal and putting the flowers on the altar. And this is really what we are invited into when we are uh, invited and respectfully participating in these ceremonies that happen to be, of course, with psilocybin mushrooms of different kinds, depending on the season and what comes. Um, so what I want to say is that in my dialogue with the Mazatec, they are not so worried about appropriation. In fact, they hope that if we use mushrooms, we're going to use them with offerings. We're going to use them with, we use them with an understanding and a learning from the from their tradition, from the way they talk to the mushroom, for the way they pray and sing and let themselves be spoken through by the mushroom, right? When we are in, in mushroom state, we are saying their words. Um, it's the mushroom speaking through us. And even further, like Paul was saying, it's the earth speaking through us. It's not even the mushroom themselves, it's the earth itself. My teacher used to say, it doesn't matter what's in the plate. She was very close to Beatrice a long visitor holy dance and Nathan Blindman and Alicius and all this wonderful uh, Lakota uh, peyote traditional holders. And they all said, it doesn't really matter what's in the plate. They were participating in each other's ceremony and saying, it's the earth that heals us. It's her power, it's her wisdom, it's her vibration that we commune with. We go back to our roots, like Paul said, of indigenous nature. Where are we from, from this earth? Where were we born? Where our ancestors were born? And in the Mexican tradition, the communing with ancestors is communing with the dead ones and communing with the other side of the veil, the other side of, of, of this reality of incarnation into the place of, of the people who have passed before us and how they are now our allies in this place where being in mushroom is being in life, in death, when time and space is irrelevant. 
I feel like in this time and space, you know, when we are now in this renaissance and psilocybin has become a wonderful uh, ally for people at the end of lives that they're still doing and other organizations are doing, um, we are invited to speak the voice of the traditional people, to be messengers for them. Of course, they are messengers themselves. And a lot of my my hope is that the Mazatec can uh, you know, come and speak to pioneers for the Mazatec to speak their voice and to have their vibration, their um, their place in this world of psychedelic renaissance. Uh, my my only hope as a humble servant of this of this mushroom is to really be a bridge to try to weave together um, a traditional practice with a. Uh, what I consider my Western approach of psychology and therapeutic space and what, what, how to create the safe space. And this has been my work for many years to train psychedelic guides and to, um, to create an environment in which they can really understand not only the traditional aspect of the work, but also the psychological dimension of what it means to provide such a powerful uh, healing uh, modality. What's important to, um, to consider in this work of commercialization and industrialization and capitalism uh, on the back of psilocybin, especially these days, is um, the, the principle of reciprocity. What do we give back? How do we turn back and say thank you? How do we include and acknowledge the indigenous people who have held indeed this tradition for thousands of years? And that's something very uh, precious to me and very important in my values. So I've been in conversation with Kat Harrison, for example, and other people in the field to see um, she was also, she has been very involved in the Mazatec tradition for even longer than I was. And so how to support, uh, what is it do we need to preserve? And you know what she said? Language. We need to help them preserve their language because the Mazatec language is the language of the mushroom. This is associated with the mushroom. Thousands of years of language in the medicine cannot be gone, you know, cannot disappear. So supporting the language, the children are preserving that language and that culture. So there's actually a conversation. Um, my daughter and I are talking about uh, creating a, a fund with various Mazatec people would decide how to utilize the fund to preserve their tradition in the in the goal of preserving tradition and supporting their health and education. We can't keep this wave from arriving. We can't keep this commercialization of psilocybin. This is a big mega uh, pharma, big pharma coming. I don't think originally the intention was bad to create some remedy to give people who are very much in suffering and I understand that the society right now is working with a certain scientific model in which psilocybin, synthesized psilocybin, is the is the product. And I am myself part of a, a research study in Los Angeles on COVID-related grief right now um, with using psilocybin. Um, so we're going to work with the peel. Uh, but conversely, I'm also involved in a uh, retreat for parental grief in Jamaica. And I'm going next week, in fact, to Jamaica to uh, meet the Jamaican physicians. And we're going to work with mushrooms, huh? mushrooms that grows there in Jamaica. So there are a lot of ways we can continue having an action, a movement, a voice, working with Oregon, huh? I'm supporting that team there, uh, Paul and I are, uh, working with what's happening in Canada and also, uh, you know, weaving our, our skills together to create an environment where the consumption of mushroom and the treatment or the offering of mushroom for, you know, uh, severe um, afflictions like grief and PTSD and uh, anxiety and depression, but also for expansion of consciousness. Ah in the spirit of solidarity and, and conservation and preservation and support, uh, we need to find our indigenous roots, communicate with indigenous people, be their voice, help them find their way of articulating their own powerful voice and create a, a solid presence in the world of sacred medicine, even in the face of commercialization. So we can continue to, to speak our voice not go to war, not create conflict, but speak loud and clear what how uh, how sacred these plans have been for us and for the future of the seventh generation. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Francoise. Um, so th there's a lot to chew on in what everyone said. Um, so one of the things that comes to mind immediately for me hearing you all talk is that it seems to me that what we're trying to do is find our way to an ethical and the most productive and the most ethical relationship that human beings can have with these substances during this time of radical transformation as to how they're being viewed. Um, and it seems to me a couple of things. One is from Gudgie's talk, it's pretty clear that we have to view these things case by case, you know, um, uh, situation by situation, plant by plant. And obviously I would put peyote in a separate category um, because for one thing, um, it, it is so hard to grow peyote. It takes so long to grow a small cactus and it really is an endangered species. And it would really be adding insult to injury to indigenous traditions for, you know, um, for white people to begin to, or to, for non-indigenous people to, to, um, to, to use it. So I think, but then the question becomes, you know, there is going to be large scale use of psychedelics. And so what are the most ethical forms that that, that can take? And Francoise, you raised that um, issue that, well, you said something very optimistic, which is that they can't be desacralized or desold because the substances themselves contain um, soul in a sense, if I understood what you were mm -hmm. saying. Um, but I think it's going to be a case by case, you know, um, uh, you know, company by company, initiative by initiative, research project by research project, and we're all going to have to be very vigilant, and um, mm -hmm. you know, and see what we can do. But um, Paul, do you have any thoughts on on that of what the at the moment the most ethical and constructive approaches can be? I think there's a, there's a there's three three clear paths here, and they're they're quite different. Um, I personally want to advocate that all wild peyote uh, be preserved and held sacred and protected for indigenous people. I just think that at this time with the ecosystems uh, being so stressed and the peyote hunt being so important for indigenous for, uh, First Nations that that resource needs to be protected. And I, I call out to all all people uh, who are uh, not in this indigenous tradition uh, to help protect the peyote uh, in the wild. It is indeed very, very difficult uh, to grow. And the wild harvest is so central to the First Nations longstanding uh, traditions. With psilocybin mushrooms, it's really different. Um, they're circumpolar, they grow all over the world. They have been used by dozens of cultures that we know of, many more that we don't know of. And so I think they're kind of the bridge uh, that unifies everyone together. Um, we can rejuvenate them, we can grow them. Um, they, um, because of their saprophytes, they grow in de decomposing material. Uh, once you get them in the culture, you can protect them. That also is not saying that mycodiversity is, is not important. Uh, indeed, microdiversity is very important. Uh, but the most commonly uh, used psilocybin mushroom in the world is Psilocybe cubensis. It's uh, not in any danger of uh, extinction. There's not even a threat in the species. It's very easy to cultivate. So I think that one is unambiguously uh, the one that I think that joins all of us together. Now, ayahuasca is complicated because I went to Cusco, I went to Peru, and I heard, but I could not believe until I saw it, neon signs flashing for, for uh, ayahuasca ceremonies, massive commercialization. Um, basically, it's the, like tour groups uh, that go and, and, take, and take ayahuasca. Um, now, on the other side of that equation, as all these people have benefited from ayahuasca, who said it's changed and helped their lives. I'm not discounting that. I'm not, you know, trying to say that's not important. Uh, but I have great reservations about the commercialization of ayahuasca um, and a cultural appropriation. You know, is also part of that part of that narrative. Psilocybin mushrooms don't have that. So I think supporting the psilocybin mushroom movement is a, builds a bridge of commonality. 
Um, it, 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 they're healing. They achieve what uh, these substances really um, give best benefit to so many people. Uh, so I would just, at uh, this time of rapid uh, ex expanding the community of people using psychedelics, I think psilocybin mushrooms um, is much more, uh, much less controversial, much more appropriate for multicultural use. Um, Francoise, any, uh, any thoughts on that? Um... On the commercialization, um, yeah. what the best approach is for? Um... Mm -hmm. I agree with Paul. I agree with Paul entirely. I mean, you know, uh, mushrooms are easy to grow. Uh, they come and go. They're fast. Uh, they're potent. They're unifying. They're, um, you know, people who do peyote do not necessarily uh, find themselves inclined to use uh, mushrooms. So. Uh, because it's a different experience. I've I've tried. Uh, I've been part of some peyote ceremonies and wachuma ceremonies, and the mescaline containing uh, cactuses are very different in nature uh, as an experience than the mushroom is. So for some people, it might be a, an issue, you know, of a preference of experience. So I can see that as a as a point of of, of, of discussion uh, and and being uh, respectful to the experience that they seek into the the miscaline containing uh cactuses so um Gaji, one thing i would ask you is that um what do you think about um you know people using synthetic mescaline right um as a you know for non-indigenous people as a substitute for the ex not a substitute but as um an experience um or um the wachuma tradition is a little different because it's a much faster growing cactus and I don't know, uh, um, people in the Andes, a lot of indigenous people are seem happy to share it because it's a different, you know, of course, they're always, indigenous people are not one unified voice. They're like all the rest of us. There are many different voices within the communities. But um, but what do you think, Gaji, about, you know, if, if we all agree that the peyote in the wild should absolutely be protected and reserved for indigenous use, what do you think about things like wachuma and things like synthetic mescaline for, for the rest of us? There are other uh, medicines, uh, Palo Santo, uh, other medicines throughout the hemisphere that get shared across uh, alliances built in the kinds of reciprocity when it comes nation to nation level. Um, I, I think that people are essentially free to uh, explore, uh, but you can scare yourself if, if done outside of the cultural context that these medicines make themselves apparent, make themselves known. They build a relationship with human beings as much as human beings build a relationship with them. And I, I understand that we're in a time in our human experience where we need to uh, restore and build bridges back to Mother Earth, the Earth Mother uh, cries for her children to uh, understand uh, the nature of reality and, and our umbilical cords to the cosmos. So I, I, uh, I encourage people to strengthen their spirits at this time. Thank you. Um, so um, I think um, I want to turn to a few audience questions that are coming in, if, if that's all right with you guys. Um, and um, several people have asked um, uh, about how mushrooms might specifically aid in end of life anxiety, which was uh, addressed in that video. Um, and also how to ethically grow mushrooms. People are asking, is there a way that they could be, you know, people are probably thinking of psilocybin. <laughs> Mono crops with fertilizer and stuff. So, uh, Paul, maybe you could address uh, those two questions. You know, um. well, I'd like to defer to uh, Francois uh, on the end of life and the anxiety, and then I'll then I'll pick up after her if I could. Okay. Like I was saying earlier, the experience of mushroom is uh, connecting us with a bigger dimension, with a bigger space and a bigger state inside that has to do with um, 
eternity with soul with what remains alive after we we'll die you know what continues to exist on the level of essence and um it also brings us in the moment in what is present here now what is the love that surrounds us and the love that we feel within us and that connection with love as a as an essential human quality and experience is really profoundly soothing and 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 healing and liberating really from the anxiety and the sadness and the grief that can be present at the end of life um i took people to mexico who were dying and eventually passed away um for the same reason of exploring the at the end of their life and and re and releasing the uh, the the stress and the anxiety that they had, uh, that they were experiencing. And uh, the experience was very much like what this woman described in your in the little clip uh, that you showed, Paul, a sense of a sense of beauty and a sense of oneness and a sense of love and, and light and uh, and freedom from uh, feeling the the earthly bind and bonds that sometimes can bring people to a sense of uh, of, of fear of leaving this this earthly plane so uh it's a beautiful experience it's very potent it's uh i totally agree with you that it should be absolutely a life like a a, a freedom a life of freedom of choice for life and and how to engage with death so paul why don't you quickly address that issue of how to, to ethical growing and if there's any risk of uh you know um, greedy people monocropping psilocybin on a large scale or something. Well, I mean, I think we need to address um, whether the mushrooms are cultivating us uh, <laughs> or we are cultivating the mushrooms. So many of these psilocybin mushrooms are, are debris, uh, grow on debris fields and humans are the greatest walking catastrophe I know creating debris fields on the planet. <laughs> and so, so many of these psilocybin mushrooms are chasing after us and uh, one, one particular species, Slosomy cyanescens, here in the Northwest, uh, in Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, I guess I guesstimate about every fourth truckload of wood chips from alder will naturally have psilocybin mushrooms in them, specifically this species, which is known as Slosomy cyanescens, is a very potent psilocybin mushroom, up to 2% psilocybin psilocin. And so it seems to be it perhaps is an endophyte growing inside of the trees, even though we've never found it um, out in the wild per se, but when those wood chips are scattered as beauty bark around you know, for landscaping, they come up in profusion. And this really was sparked the psilocybin mushroom movement in the west coast of North America, is that when they started using wood chips for landscaping, these psilocybin mushrooms literally came out of the, the woodwork, so to speak. Um, and mycologists were blindsided. The mycologists who studied them for 40, 50 years had never seen these things before. So, but the ethical cultivation of them in the landscape using natural weather cycles, I mean, how much do you really need uh, for your own personal use? Not that much. But when you talk about growing them commercially or supplying a commercial market, there are really big concerns. Many times there's not enough air exchange. You have molds and bacteria growing on them. Some people have adverse reactions like eating spoiled seafood. Um, they dry them down so the bacteria are still there. And so they can produce endotoxins, which can be very, very uh, dangerous for you. So if we are gonna have psilocybin mushrooms available clinically or by prescription, uh, or for therapeutic use, uh, they have to follow basically uh, GAP, good agricultural practices, which are in place specifically to prevent contamination. So my biggest concern about cultivation is, of course, the use of synthetic chemicals. It should be always, it has to be certified organic. It's antithetical to the entire mushroom spirit to, to grow them in a non-organic uh, non fashion. But it's really important that we have standards um, that to make sure that the mushrooms that are being consumed are safe. And that, that by far is the biggest problem, I think, with the underground movements, quote unquote, is the fact there aren't quality controls. It's somewhat self-policing because you're not gonna buy mushrooms from somebody who gave you something that made you sick, uh, but nevertheless, you don't wanna be the first person you know, in, in that experience. Um, so I think there are some quality control issues that need to be addressed. Uh, growing these in your own backyard, for your own personal purposes, you know, 
one thing that's very common with us psychonauts or myconauts is we don't do them very frequently. And we, we do a high dose of psilocybin, we go, that's it for a long time. So you really don't need a lot for yourself if you're growing them in your backyard. So I think the commercialization of, the, of growing these uh, for therapeutic purposes has to be under controlled circumstances where there are checks and controls. Great, thanks. Um, and Gunji, a question I think that um, would be best addressed by you is some people are asking, um, you know, I guess this is an allyship question of what non-Indigenous people can do to help protect those traditions, um, you know, the peyote tradition and other cultural traditions. What is the, what is the best way that that people can can help if 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 help is needed? Uh, just the alliances of different organizations in support of indigenous uh, political movements, um, protection of the ecosystems where the peyote grows in the peyote gardens of Texas, the uh, training of uh, authorities, uh, the the police who are policing the roads for the pilgrims who go to the gardens to gather for the different family fireplaces. Um, just the the tone of this generation, where all of a sudden there is a huge explosion of uh, attention to the natural, to the medicines, and to all of um, the critical components of maintaining life, uh, the earth herself, uh, the human beings, and all our relatives within that. And I think the consciousness that's engendered at the Bioneers' work is, is really uh, what's necessary for the protection of, of, of these different themes we've expressed this evening. Thanks so much, Goody. Thanks for the plug for Bioneers, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so um, another question that's come up, um, a, a few questions I'll link together, Paul and Passoise, is about um, people, of course, now hearing about this, they want to know where can they get psychedelic therapy, you know, where is it available? Um, I mean, this is quite a borderline area because places like CIS are teaching psychedelic therapy. Meanwhile, it's still illegal nationally, so we're in a very gray area moment. Um, so people are asking about that and about the best ways to grow mushrooms. And of course, Paul, you know, you, um, you can't give a, a, a workshop on, on how to grow mushrooms here. You were a great pioneer many decades ago um, in, that, in that domain, but maybe just, um, I guess people can go online, right? And find, you know, resources. But anyway, to quickly address A, where can people perhaps um, follow leads to get therapy, and what are the best ways to, to learn about growing them oneself? So as of now, the only places where uh, the consum consumption of mushroom is actually legal and accessible is the Netherlands and Jamaica. So these are the places where, and Mexico, in certain environment, the uh, legalization of mushroom in Oregon opens a door in two years from now for people to have access to uh, facilitation uh, of uh, mushroom experiences with uh, guides that will be trained and licensed by the state of Oregon to um, to, dis to distribute, dispense, and, and provide experiences to anyone coming to Oregon with the hope of, of, of having a psychedelic experience. Um, like Paul was mentioning, and I totally agree, and this is part of my goal is to train psychedelic guides, and as I've done already, <clears throat> and to um, and to uh, to create environments where necessarily, although it can very much be oriented towards a treatment, right? If someone is really depressed or has some grief or something, but it can also it can also be an experience of exploring consciousness. And so, in Oregon, all these different avenues will be available. In a couple of years, and I imagine that other states will be following um, the example or looking at Oregon how they are rolling out this uh, initiative to see how it works and and what are the the the, the pro and cons and how to adjust. So it's a very um, good situation. And then of course there's Canada, right? Of course there's Canada uh, with certain exemption in certain situations, and um, so there will be 
hopefully um, environments there that will be accessible to people wanting a, uh, a psychedelic experience with psilocybin, not necessarily with the end of life. We'll see how that expands, right? So there are still another organization will show the way for that. So in other words, opportunities are opening up, but it's still in transformation and it's still a nascent emerging field. That's right. So Paul, if you could quickly just talk about the growing, just for those folks who want to know about that, what your best best advice is for them to get information. Um, well, there's lots of books out there that have good information on how to cultivate. But I think, um, you know, I think law enforcement really looks at intention. Um, if you are intending to make a lot of money by dosing people with psilocybin uh, without the guardrails of a therapist or a medical community, um, I think you're, you're really pushing the envelope and you're likely to be in trouble. So people should be very careful about that. If you're trying to monetize this for personal gain to make money, using the excuse or the, you know, pretending or even intentionally uh, part of that is you're trying to give people help, but you're trying to also make money and capitalize on it. And then I think it's, it becomes a, a difficult argument to convince uh, that you're actually just doing it for the good of the people. Um, so I think the, the training of therapists, the training of physicians mm -hmm. is a very, very clear path and a legal and legally def defensible path. And it would not be uh, high up on law enforcement's priority list compared mm -hmm. to somebody who's uh, selling a bunch of psilocybin mushrooms at raves and trying to make money, you know, hand over fist. I think uh, the intention of the individual uh, participating at this this new stage um, will greatly influence whether the government and law enforcement mm -hmm. is going to crack down. They don't want to have a bad case, you know. So if you are involved in truly helping people with PTSD, veterans, et cetera, other traumatized individuals, then I think that um, mm -hmm. you know that that's a, that's a much safer route. But please. Mm -hmm. Be careful, consult with mm -hmm. medical professionals, create records of correspondence of what your intentions are, you know, create your data sets so you are supporting your true intentions. Um, and if you know people are going into this in a big commercial thing, I said this in my previous talk, I pay a lot of taxes, folks. I think, you know, the fact that people are making a lot of money and not paying their fair share you know, for helping people on welfare and unemployment and post office and highways, all that stuff. You know, let's not, you know, let's not be uh, naive about this. People are making money mm -hmm. and they're not paying their fair share. So I think it's important mm -hmm. they step up to the plate and help the commons. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to see that psychedelics and civic responsibility go hand in hand. Uh, this feels like a, <laughs> yeah. a, a, a civic course along with a, uh, um, um, so one, one of the other uh, questions people have is, um, you mentioned microdosing at one point, Paul, um, um, but you've also discussed the heroic dosages. And uh, so some people are interested in uh, what, are, uh, what, are the, you know, what are the advantages or the uses of microdosing vis-a-vis -a, -vis a full blown experience. And, um, and not just with psilocybin, but I guess we have not discussed at all things like LSD, which I think has been outside of the parameters of this conversation, but some people have asked about. We can't address everything and we only have a couple of minutes left, but maybe this question of microdosing, um, do you, is that in a separate category of, of usefulness than the kind of things we've been talking about for end of life anxiety and PTSD? Well, we're, we're, we're navigating uh, based on, on the science. This is fact-based medicine. Um, again, there's an app, microdose.me. We're doing massive meta studies that we're about supplying the information to others that want to do clinical studies. Others that want to do clinical studies. But many of us are beginning to subscribe to the theory, not a hypothesis, that after a major dose, a heroic experience, a therapeutic dose, then microdosing subsequently may uh, the same neurological pathways that led to a breakthrough uh, treatment and overcoming PTSD, those neurological pathways, uh, pathways are resonant. You have a neurological memory. And by microdosing then, you're able to re-stimulate those pathways so they become resonant. Mm -hmm. So we think microdosing in the long term may have really great benefits uh, where you don't need to be under um, a clinical hospital environment with tremendous support from the medical community. So microdosing might be liberation mycology uh, that helps you to go beyond 
be working with a therapist because you've, in a sense, have been trained, you've been there, done that. And now microdosing, I think, neurologically brings back these neurological pathways that, are, that become resident to, for your mental well being. I'd heard of radical mycology, but liberation mycology is a new one on me. I'm going to have to remember that. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that we are getting, to, we've gotten pretty much to the end of our time here. And I really just wanted to thank you all. Thank you, Francoise and Gudji and Paul. This was a great conversation. Of course, for every point raised, we could have had a, a two day, you know, uh, yeah. workshop. And so um, hopefully this will be just the, the beginning, the instigation of further conversations. But it's really been a lot of fun and uh, and uh, very informative. And um, yeah, let's do it again sometime in some other context. So um, thank you all and uh, till next time. Oh, and um, just for those people um, listening in the audience, if you're interested in any of the participatory sessions uh, coming afterwards, I think there's still ways to sign up for those. Um, check on one of the buttons on, on somewhere up here and, uh, you know, um, otherwise, for the rest of us, we're going to sign out. All right. Goodbye. Thank Good you. Afternoon.